we go. Live. Tuning in. <coughs> There we go, Stephen Jones, how y'all doing? Got some folks lining in the Vintage Sportsman. I like that name. That's what's up. I'm excited, I'm gonna let some, some more folks kind of roll in a little bit. Daryl's my dad, but Darrell, but I appreciate it. <laughs> it's all good, it's all good. He wasn't too creative when he named me, so, you know, now you know who my dad is. But it's good to see you, Mr. Jones. It is good to see you. Um, I actually need to heat up. It's all good. No apologies needed, my man. Um, let me go turn on this kettle real quick. I'm going to make some coffee in the process. It's the morning, and I really ain't got through it, so y'all give me one second. And I'm gonna let people trickle into. say this a few more times for the folks that's kind of rolling in but um i want to talk about preserving our time on this planet um through art and what i think our responsibility and role is as sportsmen um you know and how and what that looks like as um for me you know what tools can i use which is my artwork um and my creative vision to talk about our time um, and honestly some of the other experiences, the artists and stuff that really inspire me. Um, if y'all don't mind, I'm gonna use some notes because I don't wanna forget anything. I'm also recording uh, this as well uh, for the Sporting Life uh, Notebook podcast. So all of this will be up. I'll probably honestly take like a break, take a week off <laughs> and just get caught up with um, publishing this content onto the podcast um, and getting caught up with episode summaries, transcripts, and blah, 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 blah. All of the things that come with podcasting. But in addition um, to this theme, right, of preserving our time, um, you know, in, in nature and discussing that through art, um, I'm actually going to talk about how that applies to this piece right here behind me. Um, it's a commissioned work um, from for a gentleman named Andrew Sullivan. That and that's my kids hollering in the background. <laughs> They're awake doing homework. Um, but I uh, I want to talk about the breakdown of this piece, um, the process. You know what what it's. Uh, what it's like and doing it and, and all kinds of things like that. So let me get this. That's cool, buddy. I see it's a chicken. <laughs> so my son is excited because he's actually catching on um, really well with Chinese and uh, Spanish and all kinds of other things like that. Learning phonics, numbers, all of that. So it's pretty cool. Um, but, so this, like I said, this stuff will be on the YouTube channel. I also got a chance, I wanna show y'all this. If y'all get a chance to check this book out here, Combi, by Dr. Uh, Etta Fields Black. So we went to her, um, uh, 
I guess, writer's discussion. Uh, introducing her book. I don't know what the formal name of it, but anyway, her writers talk about this book. She's a PhD, um, but it's about Harriet Tubman, the, Com the, Com the Combahee River raid and black freedom during the Civil War. Um, but there's a ton of historical information in it that is new to um, new to the field of research and body of research. So excited to like start reading this this book along with another book of mine. Hold on, that's my coffee. So Coffee is a thing. A little pour over. So, like I was saying, coffee is my thing. I need it to wake up. Um, this book here, there's a ton of historical research, um, but in the spring and summer of 1863, the outcome of the Civil War. Why is my signal going low? Um, but basically, it talks about. Um, you know, attacks on plantations during the Civil War, how Harriet Tubman contributed to it, um, and like the firsthand details of, of all of that stuff. Check it out, it was really cool. So, what I wanna talk about, we got some folks kinda of trickling in. Again, I wanna talk about what we do with nature. I don't know why my signal is dropping so bad. But I want to talk about our time on this planet, what we do with nature, so on and so forth, um, and how I do that through my artwork. And I want to break down this piece here. Um, so pardon me, like I said, if I use notes, because there's a lot from my sketchbook. That I'm, my signal is just getting real wonky. I don't like that. Hang on. Big Money G, the one Big Money G. What's up, man? All right, I think we're good. If the signal gets kind of wonky, let me know. Um, but the first and foremost, just my goal on this show is to really talk about all of the artwork and things that kind of that I brought forth. Like, let me see if I can maybe pick it up. Maybe the signal does that well. So what I want to do is talk about my, here we go, Ramon Badahar. What's going on, man? Is my signal jumping in and out on y'all? Is it good or no? Thumbs up if it is or not. I want to make sure before I start <laughs> talking too much. Is it good? I'm not sure my signal is doing well. I don't know why I'm in a good spot in my house. All right. If it acts up, let me know. But, like I said, we can get to it. Boom. My background, as far as a wing shooting guide, has allowed me to explore. Like, And that was my biggest thing. If you heard my, my last weekend kind of conversation, my biggest thing was to be able to explore across the country and really talk about that and, ex and and express what I think about not only what the country looks like, but the state of it, um, and be able to bring that content to you guys, um, what our outdoor community really looks like, what's going on in the industry, and I'm, I'm very tapped into a lot of that stuff. Um, but the most exciting part of that is that my wing shooting career has taken me across the country. I've got all of these great, brilliant photographs. Um, and the whole time I've been making various forms of artwork from, from writing to uh, making videos to making artwork. And the whole time I was actually painting about it. Um, the whole time I was painting about it. And what's funny is I never actually released a lot of that work as I was writing about it and so my gallery dealer matter of fact um, 
Bill Lowe at the time, he had passed away, um, and it was, and I really wanted him to come to, to my American, the first American Soul, American Soul, but Bill passed away from cancer, and I had been focusing on this type of work, um, but the whole while I was doing another body of work that was focused in watercolor um, and figurative concepts, so on and so forth. Um, and I was, it was the artwork that I felt like matched the writing. So if you've read any of my articles, it was kind of that type deal. Um, I hadn't shown that work to anyone. I didn't, I, I and I, I preface that to say my background is actually in representational and figurative drawing and painting. Um, I went abstract late in the game. <laughs> um, up until I was probably about, um, around the time I was about 22, I had been doing strictly representational, figurative work, so on and so forth. Um, and my mentor, Mr. Peta, Peta Oiwari. Um, hey, Shandri, how you doing? Yeah. Good. Um, my mentor, Peta Oiwari, um, out in Riverdale, on the south side of Atlanta. He used to stay a few houses down from me at that point. Um, a few houses down, and since I was about 15, up until into college. Um, he mentored me, done all of that, and really taught me watercolor painting. Um, and rejudged everything I knew about uh, figurative and representational art. He's from uh, Nigeria. I did that for the longest time, and I was making paintings about people and the body and the human form and things like that. One, and I actually did not understand abstraction for the longest time. Um, and what I thought I was doing, everything I've always done has kind of been uh, journalistic in some ways. So at the time when I was younger, I was painting about people, sure. Um, but in the process of painting about people, I was still talking about people and what was going on in life. Um, I look at some of the stuff that I was doing in high school, running around the streets of Atlanta, and what that looked like, you know, what old National Highway looked like at 12 o'clock at night, you know, and those of y'all from here, y'all know about so on and so forth. I was talking about that side of the culture at the time. Um, I always find myself, like I said, journaling, documenting what things. Uh oh, we got some, some a few more people joining. Um, so from that point, all through college, I didn't understand abstraction, and then I'm down in South Georgia um, at Albany State University, and I didn't understand, again, y'all heard me say this before, I didn't really understand the quail paintings and bird dogs and this and that. I, that wasn't really familiar with me to me, and I didn't even realize that I was really going to school in quail country, Bob White quail country. Um, it didn't mean anything. I grew up training pit bulls on the south side of town and I wasn't making any any kind of dog connections at that time. But what I what it did was open me up to exploring abstraction while I was down in college. So I really, I had done a couple of pieces in high school but I really didn't get abstraction and I can tell because I look at some of that stuff now, my granddaddy has it and it just, it, it wasn't, real abstraction. It was representation trying to be abstraction. Um, but nevertheless, I was documenting myself at the time through what I thought was a Basquiat <laughs> or Basquiat style. It was not, uh, but it was a nice attempt. So by the time I got to Albany State, I'm seeing all of these bird dog drawings and quail and this and that. Doesn't make sense to me. And so I start getting bored with representation figures and start trying to break down abstraction. And then around that same time, I started interning at the, at the Bill Lowe Gallery, a gallery I would then years down the road later be represented by. Um, that was pretty cool just because I, I, it opened me up to seeing abstraction even further. And that was here up in Atlanta. So during the summers when I would come home from college, I would intern at um, the Bill Lowe Gallery here in Atlanta. I saw an artist named Harry Alley. Um, he was, at the time, he was represented by Bill, and it was Harry's work was abstract. 
these kind of ghost-like figures that would pop up through his work. Um, and I thought it was really cool, but the work was built on like a bed of mud and clay and dirt and so on and so forth. And let me know if my signal is going in and out, but we got a few more people joining. Thank y'all for joining. Um, but yeah, I would see people, I'm sorry, I would see his work and see images kind of coming out of the dirt and the mud that he was using. So that was the first the time that I really started uh, digging into going in and out. There we go. Once I, once I got to that point, um, I had done my first very large piece. It was six feet by four feet wide. Um, it's actually at Albany State now. Um, so the very first abstract, truly abstract piece that I made was in a crazy time. My internet, if my internet is going out, I'm so sorry, y'all. But I was documenting the very first piece you can find in South Georgia is where I was going at Albany. There we go. My signal is acting up, y'all. I'm so sorry. So, having my first piece in South Georgia at Albany State in the There we go. Thumbs up, if y'all can hear me. Good, all right. The very first piece that I had in South Georgia, obviously, was at Albany State, and so it was kind of a homecoming for me to have my second year of American Soil, American Soul, um, down in, I got my start in Bird Dogs, where I got my start in handling, met Neil, and the story really starts to unfold there. Um, but through art, I was able to, again, connect what we're doing on this planet and the people that we're interacting with and the stories that we have. I was able to bring that to, to the forefront through art. My podcast did it first and it was great, but now there's a bridge. Um, as a guide, what it's done was really open up a lot of my clients to my work. So that was honestly the thing that really boosted my client base was guiding people on hunts and really not selling artwork, but selling the story of the space that they are hunting in. A lot of these places where I'm guiding is classic Bob White country. Uh, you gotta, you gotta appreciate the people that were there before you, the knowledge, the wisdom, so on and so forth. And the entire time, like I said, I've been painting about it. Um, and it never showed that work. So when you go down to Thomasville for this show, you guys are gonna see this painting um, along with a bunch of new works that are watercolor focused, watercolor India uh, ink pieces, and a few of them from our last year's show that are really monolithic. Um, I've got one out there named Clotilda, and that was a piece honestly documenting um, Africa Town in Mobile, Alabama. Um, and the Clotilda, the last slave ship, that came into the U.S. and then they burned it down and that community was stuck here, basically in Africa town. Um, it was the first successful African, uh, African settlement here in America. Um, so, that being said, before I really get into the depths of this piece, this season, which y'all should expect on the YouTube channel, um, is a fir the, the visual form of what it is that I'm painting about. When I go on these hunts, you guys will find all kinds of video um, that tell the story of these hunts. I'll be in Arizona. Um, so what I'm really excited about, and this will be after the American Soul, American Soul show, but in Arizona, I want to pull a lot of that inspiration, um, that indigenous, the, the, the aspects of indigenous culture, the patterns, the textiles, so on and so forth as well. Once I'm able to do that, um, I'll end up having another body work for the third show down the road. But I think what's really cool is being able to take elements from being from Atlanta and being in the industry, being able to, to bring elements of graffiti, so on and so forth, and primitive and indigenous writing and wall making, bring it all together into one format. Um, and that is the summation of, let me make sure that I didn't miss anything. I take a lot of notes. Um, but there's a lot of things that I wanted to make sure that you guys understood about my work. Um, but let's talk a little bit first about the reasoning behind shit. Because a lot of folks are like, man, Sporting Life is just 
bird dogs and I had a buddy of mine was like, man, you know, it's not just a bunch of bird dogs anymore. Well, no. My goal was always to elements of my life together. Um, when I left teaching, I felt like I never really stopped teaching. Um, when I when I was able to start doing more learn to hunts, I was able to then extend the conversation, the what I think are the visual aspects of the work and so on and so forth. Um, it created a really awesome conversation um, with really opened up a lot of people my work started opening up a lot of people in my community in the Atlanta community to the conversation about nature um, in a visual format music does it that's why I started incorporating more of my own sound and, and music into my podcast and show and so on and so forth but I was able to connect you know really the black community here in Atlanta to the outdoors and the spaces that I was going and the stories that are out there. Um, so that's why the visual aspects of, of, of my work mean so much, and I want to talk about that too. Um, it was important to me because I, I do live on, straddle both sides of the fence of, you know, urban and, and, and suburban and rural um, America. And those communities are disconnected, but they don't have to be within my work. And I also want to make the work aspirational, um, somewhat nostalgic, um, and something that also reaches back to the people that came before us and the people that came, uh, that, that come down the road. Like I said, the part of, you know, my mission is to make sure that we're celebrating the outdoors, leaving it better than we found it, but also bringing people in and making it accessible. Um, and I, I really think and this is oh Tanaya is here thank you what's up tonight um but one of the things that I, I quoted in my work through, uh is what sustains us through history and I was reading that from or I heard it from a like a Jason Isbell uh record and I thought that was really cool and I think it's our responsibility to document where we are and who we are at this time I think Neolithic people were doing that with cave painting. So there's a nod to that within my work. But I also think graffiti artists are doing that nowadays. You come to the city of Atlanta or any major city, there's that connection again. People are doing exactly that. Um, you have to think that communication is the, the most consistent thing. It, 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 it builds culture and it breaks culture at the same time. Um, it builds relationships and it breaks relationships. It, it, it's communication. Um, ink and pigment on a wall is the earliest form of communication. Billboards, the same thing. Um, you know, and who we are um, in, you know, through history. You, people have been naturally inclined to do that. When I think about like music, Neolithic people, there are, are documents of early flutes, right? Made from bird bones and things. People have always, 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 always expressed, uh, people have always expressed themselves through the medium of art and music and language. Um, and by language, I mean the, the auditory and actual script. So let's talk about this. Um, there's a lot of artists right now that feel compelled to speak up about the times, political times, um, climate, environment. Like right now, whether I read art, um, if I read art for for a magazine, or if I'm looking at other outlets that talk about what's going on, you know, Stevie Wonder just released a song and things like that. Um, various artists are talking about climate impacts and things, and so. Right now, a lot of people feel compelled to do that. And that's how I know culture is changing. I know society is changing. Something is coming really, really awesome in 2025. I don't know what that is, but I'm seeing artists build up. But I also understand the responsibility that Ashley and I have been given um, by having American Soil, American Soul 2 um, in Thomasville in a very specific place that has so much to do with history. Um, we have to over deliver 
with the artwork and the impact that it has on our audience, right? Um, I want this to talk about the American experience right now from what it does, what it's doing to the, so the soil, right? The, the me part of things and the soul, right? The Ashley part of things, the things that raise the vibration of um, the country. We can do that through artwork. Um, so let's talk about my work, right? And, and what I think this is. So, so this piece first and foremost um, is a piece from, for my good buddy, Drew, Andrew Sullivan, um, but what I wanted to do in this piece was preserve a memory of his. So Drew is an avid outdoorsman. Um, he's done a lot for Minority Outdoor Alliance um, and in, in creating a lot of, you know, really, really awesome, interesting opportunities, introduced us to, not, you know, incredible people. Um, and because of that, he was really, really, he couldn't make the first show, so he wanted to commission me to do this painting behind it is I think when I made it I think this painting is probably six or seven feet wide and like five I think like five feet tall or something like that um, but the story behind the work is what I thought was really cool I wanted it to nod like I said back to Neolithic wall painting and people doing that um, but then I also again wanted to bring that into the present and the future um, juxtaposed with graffiti so past present you know or I'm sorry the, the past and the present and future um, so that's where you'll see a lot of that right it should but it should look like when you come to the city if you go to the West End or if you go anywhere downtown you'll see a lot of old walls that are coming apart because somebody's tagged it and graffitied it up over a whole bunch of years and I've always been really captivated by that um, I got into that when I was in, in grad school for my master's I'm an artist Rocio Rodriguez I was in her class she's a fantastic um, abstract artist um, and you should go look her up Rocio R-O-C-I-O -O, Rodriguez a little short Cuban but she's a little short Cuban lady You'd walk around the school like a little military journal she would drive a truck around our art studios and make sure that we were in there. But she introduced me to looking at old graffiti um, as a way of understanding it and really understanding time. Um, and I can and I attributed that, like I said, to Neil at people. So that's been a major feature within my work. What this should look um, standing in a decoy, a duck decoy. Right over there, you should be able to see uh, a duck decoy. Let me just take you up to it. Hang on. Right here. Uh, one is your white tail. And then another duck here. And then another one here. Um, all of those are done in gold leaf. Um, the gold leaf, 24 karat gold leaf, um, as a way, number one, gold is a source of energy and, and positive vibration. But then also, um, I wanted the things on the wall to be celebrated, right? The creatures, the animals, that was my way of, of celebrating that by decking it out in gold. Um, but then also the inclusion of language, right? So you should be able to, I mean, there's words up at the top. That was my daughter. Um, there's words on the bottom right there. Juxtapose, there's lay, dirt. Um, I thought it was really cool to incorporate language, um, obviously for graffiti, but then taking it a step further, um, I come to find out that I, one of the areas that I train bird dogs in Tuskegee is not far from the origins and the birthplace of one of my favorite artists, Zora Neale Hurston. Zora Neale Hurston was one of those artists that, she's an anthropologist, really, but she's one of those anthropologists that wasn't really understood till well late in the game, like after she died, but she was from Nottasuga, Alabama, and that's not too far from um, where I trained bird dogs with, with a buddy of mine, George Gordon, if y'all have seen that stuff that I posted in the past. And so, 
one day after I got done training with George, I ended up going down a little bit of a rabbit hole and I was leaving, leaving Tuskegee and I actually went looking for where my people are from in Alabama from Lochapoca. Um, and so in the process of going through, going to find Lochapoca, which is a little small city town in Alabama, um, where my grandmama is actually from, Lochapoca was one of those places that ended up actually was on, I think, Nanasuga is on the way to Lochapoca. Um, Zora Neale Hurston is from there, and I got into her work because she explores dialect, like African American dialect, in addition. Um, my signal is acting crazy again, I'm sorry, y'all. But she's exploring. Is it? All right, thumbs up if y'all can hear me. All right, cool. Um, exploring African American dialect in a way that was very honest. So she was doing a lot of slave reviews and things like that. Um, and what you don't really see in a lot of literature from early on is other than like the, the WPA files that they were actually in governmental files that they were interviewing slaves and so on and so forth. You hear it, but Zora Neale Hurston was writing it, right? So like she was getting these real time interviews and in, in at one point in time, people were saying that that like, Zora Neale Hurston thought it was. And so I, as a, as a piece of it, you know, language, right, on top of language here. So you see my lay, but then you've got pecans. Pecans piece was obviously the, like, the, 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 the proper grammar, right, the proper English. It's the thing that, it's, it's the way that you write, the way that the letters are laid out right here the, the way that the letters are laid out right there um it is what proper english should be but then behind it you've got there right so there but it was written like that in slave narratives um and i thought that was pretty cool to be able to have that set on top of there and again documenting language over a long span of time right so is it you know old english or old dialect not english but old dialect sitting on top of or, or reverberating through you know new cleaner language right um movement and things like that all of that was important um because i was also capturing that in a lot of my films right so if you look at dogman people like dogman so much because it was real it was raw it was the culture and it is the culture right and it was and i'm glad we did it because it preserved neil neil's no longer here with us um it preserved neil and his legacy right it preserved his voice and, and i wanted to do that within all of our work um so with american soil american soul you should be able to get you should also be able to get an understanding of how history has turned over the course of time, right? It's not just the horses, it's not just the dogs. Yes, the imagery is there, but you should also be able to feel in time. So, if y'all are liking the piece, leave some thumbs up or hearts or something like that. Um, but also, I guess let me move this chair. But that right over there, all of this, the grounding, is what I really, really want. You'll be able to see all of this here, this texture, so on and so forth within the work. And this is all on canvas. Um, gold leafing right there. Uh, I like for various parts of the piece to be coming off. And again, white tail here. That, to me, um, like I said, was my way of celebrating nature. Um, and if y'all have any questions too, y'all are more than welcome to ask. Um, but that was my way of celebrating nature um, in that piece. And at the same time, preserving the memory of, um, of Drew's early, early, early experience. The reason that that white tail, and I got to tell you the story, I never really broke the story down. So how I went about making this work, uh, he asked, he commissioned me to do it, but I did what I did was I asked Drew, 
tell me a story about your favorite, most memorable hunt. Like, let's just start there. And I recorded it. Um, if I can find the audio, I'll post it here on the, the, you know, podcast version if I can find the audio somewhere. But I recorded it. Um, and he told me a story about hunting. He was a deer hunter growing up, not a deer hunter, a, a waterfowl hunter growing up. Um, and white-tailed deer weren't very prevalent where he was at in Wisconsin. Um, back in the day, they just weren't around like that. People really didn't see him. So he was out, um, I think, with his dad uh, duck hunting. His dad had a huge influence on him growing up. And so he says he was sitting in a duck blind one morning, just waiting, you know, wait for him to come through. Decoys out. And he says off in the distance, he ends up seeing this huge, beautiful white tail buck. Um, and it just struck him. And it was, a, it was the thing that he just vividly remembers because they weren't, they were, they were conservation success. And Andrew is a big, uh, big into conservation. So, you know, I thought that was a special thing that I wanted to make sure that it preserved. And, and in a lot of ways, it kind of was like a, oh, look at that, like a, a, a once in a lifetime experience, I guess, back then. And I, I, I don't want us to take that for granted. We've got a lot of deer down here in Georgia, but at one point in time, you know, they weren't very available. But whitetails are also, in, again, an American conservation success story. Um, so I wanted to preserve that for Drew as well and really get it. But the I wanted it to have kind of a mythical feel in addition to a nod to uh, primitive people. So the mythical feel, instead of it, the deer being way far off in my brain, I wanted through, uh, that deer would be walking through the duck blind. I wanted that deer to be walking through the duck blind and kind of turn its head back, look like it was like looking at you, right, in surprise. So you see it from that back angle there. Um, you know, and then maybe a, a decoy out, you know, you know, with that duck over there, you don't really know if it's a, a if it's a, a live duck or is it a decoy, right? What what are they doing? There's some that I wanted, uh, I thought about, I don't think I'm gonna do it, but I thought about actually having a, a wing, a, an open wing duck coming in as if it was coming into the spray, but I think I, I'm just gonna leave it there. Um, but I really, really, for me leveling up my work. So when you get here to American Soil, American Soul, this piece, um, we're blessed that it is going to be shown before it goes to California. Um, it's going to Palm Springs in California, so we, we get a chance to do that. But like I said, the I wanted the Sporting Life Notebook to become more expansive than just the dogs because that's only a small part of the... The, in terms of the many different components that go into it. The dogs are important, but how do we celebrate their legacy as well as the legacies of so many others? How do we how do we preserve the memory of these things? Um, and so you'll also see there's another piece that I want to do about that size with like pointers and setters in the background. Um, one pointer, one setter, a true brace. I think I might title it that. I've been mulling it around, but it'll be big like that. Um, I'm hoping I can get it done before the show. Um, but yeah, I wanted to celebrate these animals, these creatures, the habitat, um, celebrate history, um, the outdoors. Those of y'all that are coming in, for some odd reason, my internet has been acting crazy. So sorry if it's cutting in and out on you. Um, so yeah, man, I'm, I'm excited to bring that. And that was just the furtherance of what I think is our responsibility um, into the out able to um, build up over the last few years um, and after actually after my account my old account got hacked after that did I was like well let's think about it for thank y'all for the new folks that are joining but yeah after my old account got hacked I had to think about like what are we really doing with this platform now like what comes next um, and that was that was really 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 important to me um, hold on one second guys I actually need to, I'm recording this for the podcast too, so I wanted, and I need to shift a couple of things around, y'all give me one second, I'm going to move this computer, there we go, um, 
So yeah, it was it is it was the extension of journaling for me, and that's what painting has always been for me. And so, I, and I also bounce between these two very opposite styles in a way. Um, so again, at the show, you'll see, like I said, my watercolor pieces in addition to my assemblage and mixed media pieces. Um, and I want to continue to tell stories through that. Um, and so, like I said, everything that we're doing is just one very, 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 very large um, project. So, you know, hold on. There we go. So, with that being said, um, I want to kind of also talk about why that I use certain materials and things like that. So, the construction of this piece right here, wing shot fall, what's up, buddy? Um, the construction of this piece right here, um, there's a crossover between, like I said, I, I exist in like these dualities when it comes to making art. Um, but, uh, how do I say it? Half of the piece is built with household everyday materials. The other half is legit built with dirt <laughs> in the outdoors. Um, and I don't think I've actually ever really recorded the process to, to my works, but I don't mind it like because it always comes out so different. Um, and there's no way to replicate these pieces here. Um, and I say that because the household materials, um, regular house paint, um, spray paint, clearly, um, let me see, your obvious pencils and things like that, a um, little bit of tape, and let's see, I mean, gold leaf, I don't know if that's a household material, you get it at art stores and so on and so forth, so there's that, right, I wanted, I always wanted my pieces to be accessible, and pieces that, they, they, they weren't, obviously, I, I, when I started this process, there's an interview with my granddaddy um, that I posted, not interview, but it was me asking him about my work. Um, Uh-oh, Dave is in the room, too. Um, but there's an interview that I posted a, a day or so ago with my granddaddy walking around my gallery, and he was talking about my work, um, making it early on. But early on, I, oh, for one, I just didn't have a whole uh, <laughs> lot of money and resources uh I didn't have a whole lot of money and resources to actually be making these these really, really exquisite, fine, I just didn't have a lot of money and resources to do it. But what I did have was my granddaddy's backyard and a whole bunch of paint and spray paint and stuff that I that he had left over, um, but then also that I had bought and had in art school. So I was like, all right, how are we gonna do this? Um, so the pieces should be able to be accessed by anybody. Um, one thing that the art world, world does, and the bird dog world, to be totally honest, um, the art world, there are gatekeepers at times. Um, and there are people that make things seem like you should either pay more money than what you really should, or, um, you know, or there's just going to be something that, you, some reason or thing that, that, kind of dissuades people from getting into it um whether it's a dog people overpricing dog this and that or if it's you know people feeling like you got to have the fanciest guns and this and that or clothes and god knows whatever else it's there's usually some or with the art world right like you've got to have you got to have these super long extravagant extravagant conversations and stuff that go over people head like we can do that and there's an audience for that um and i appreciate that because just like any museum just like any encyclopedia just like anything you need an analysis of things on a higher level i think that you need field trial dogs i that is one reason why i liked all age dogs because at the end of the day they are the standard and kind of a accountability for quality there right you need these institutions to continue to uplift them through history. But as I appreciate that, I also appreciate the working artist, not the Jeff Coons of the world, but 
the artist that is that is doing it every day and using the environment and the things that he has readily available to it. One of those things, one of those artists that I really, really like, um, not only John Michelle Basquiat, sure, there's a nod to that, but Thornton Dial. Um, Thornton Dial and the G's been quilt makers of Alabama. Um, Thornton Dial's from Bessemer, Bessemer, Alabama, but check him out. You'll see a lot of the references there um, within my work, but Thornton Dial couldn't read, um, grew up in the backcountry Alabama and used everyday materials. He worked in, I think, a steel factory or something like that, so he knew how to build things, and those works show that, right? They also communicate a truly deep African-American experience in who we are as a people, as a culture, but he was also talking about what was going on in his community, in his environment, so talking about hurricanes um, and what that does to the community. You know, one of the places that I go hunt, matter of fact, I've seen that type of impact from Hurricane Michael in South Georgia. Um, so not only was he making artwork about the people and the times, but he was making artwork about the space, and that is what I wanted to do. The pecans piece right here. That is from a sign um, in South Georgia. It's at Merritt's Pecan uh, Company. If y'all are driving down 85, and you'll see the sign for pecans. You'll, you'll, if you go to Merritt's, um, you'll kind of see where I got that inspiration, but that was a way of, again, capturing the space, the time, um, and a nod to literacy, you know, in there. So, all, let me see. The piece also needs to have some kind of duality and symmetry. So, there, you've got lines right there, and they should move you, basically, around the painting. Um, I think painting should be very active. Um, and active doesn't mean a lot of paint, doesn't mean a lot of anything. You can have a, a Rothko painting that is very active and it doesn't really have Rothko in big one or two color paintings that people uh, trip out about. I really like them. My wife really, really likes them. Um, but active doesn't necessarily mean a lot of stuff. And I tend to have a lot of stuff in my work. Um, what I mean is active in terms of what it's pulling from you, what it's doing to you, and how it's moving you around the entire composition. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's something that I really, really focus on. So, now that we're talking about the man-made piece of it, there's, an, there's the effect of nature on my work, like the literal effect. So what, it, what ends up happening is, I'll create a ground and a background for that, or in like a foundation, and it'll be purely white. Um, I use a, a combination of like glue and dirt and uh, joint compound stuff to hold sheet walk, uh, sheet rock up and stuff. So I use a combination of glue, dirt, and joint compound to create a ground. And I'll leave that ground outside, um, preferably in the sun. Uh, pardon me, y'all. Um, I'll leave it in the sun, or if it rains, leave it out there. Leave the entire piece out into the weather and just let the weather Connection still good, y'all? Perfect. Um, so I'll leave that, and thank y'all for tuning in, man. I really appreciate it. It's artist talk. Um, but I'll leave that combination of dirt, joint compound, and glue, uh, coat the whole thing, leave it outside in nature. Let the sun tear it on due to the painting. As long as it doesn't blow away, I'll let the weather do what it's going to do. What it does is actually create kind of a patina right here. So if you see this kind of, this kind of ashy looking, that's what nature does to joint compound and that little combination that I make right there. Um, and it gives it kind of a, a grit to it, right? Um, what I appreciate about it, just like nature, it is totally unpredictable as to what, what I want to do. And I think, and, and again, wondering how this even relates to bird dogs well there's an unpredictable nature of developing bird dogs right when you go hunting you don't know whether you're going to find something there's a there's a a the constant variable of the most predictable thing about nature is its unpredictability you know and and that's something that i think um 
and it's something I've been I've had to consider when I'm out guiding and things like that. So I wanted to add a level of unpredictability to that work. Once I get that ground and I leave it out for as long as I need to get the look that I want in it, that's when we start painting. Um, and so from there, I actually start outlining. Start, um, I start outlining the images here, saying, "What's up, buddy?" Um, and really, really, really breaking down what I think the piece will be like. Now, I think it's important to have things. Let me show y'all something. I think it's important to do something weird with the eyes, right? This letter right here should either sit in or out of the C and the E, right? Um, it should not mess with your eyes, but it should give you something to discuss within yourself. Is it on top or is it behind? You know, is slang, right? Is, is dialect and slang coming through despite the persistence of common language? Something that I deal with all the time. Um, you know, when we get around families and things like that or get around people of our own, we talk a certain kind of way, but, you know, we also are, are encouraged to present ourselves with things. I also decide what areas I think are going to work and how do I maintain certain things. So if you look at that, I like this color sitting on top of this color, right? I mean, this white sitting on top of this like plum thing. And I wanted this, right, to sit and juxtapose this red here. This is a really harsh red line and it makes you think um, honestly, it makes me think about a, a gunshot or like sh shooting this deer right here. It, it just gives me that. And that's a very striking image. So I wanted that splat to contrast this here, honestly, to break some of the intensity of that line up with something more flat like that. And then that splat against a white square. Um, yeah, you have to do things. Uh, you have to do things in artwork to break things up. Um, I was represented by, or before I was actually represented by Bill Lowe, um, and I was trying to get there. Um, I would sit in the gallery and talk to Bill about, and like Bill is my like Neil Park. There's a year and a half, two years ago. Anyway, um, Bill Lowe is like the Neil Carter for me of, of art, but he would tell me that certain lines and intensity and certain the way that things feel you have to soften it at a time there was an artist i'm not gonna say his name but there's an artist that was about my age um at the time and was also represented at the gallery um a little bit before me and he had these incredible figures um and i'm on the figure's hands and and that was the thing that would prevent a sale of an artwork is these claws. You you never you'd be surprised at what certain lines and things look like to people, right? And and the nuances of what art does. And the pieces would be he would be like, man, the pieces are fantastic. But then you get to these claws, and it would just be like so striking. Um, and so I have to think about that, you know, that work. So if you look at it, to me that. It just looks like a bullet. It just does, which I'm fine. That was me throwing paint and the way that the line went. Again, there's that improbable nature of it. Um, I was fine with it, but I wanted to give it something else to kind of lighten that. And again, put it smack in, not in the middle of the line, but in a, a kind of perpendicular kind of fashion um, to break your eye from that. A lot of mental gymnastics going on right up in there. Um, but I thought it was important to do so. Um, there are some areas where I like paint to fall off. So let me show you. Right here, I like paint to fall off and things like that. Um, because if you were walking around the city of Atlanta, like I said, the West End is kind of a, a really popular area for graffiti that I really like photographing stuff. But if you were walking around there, those walls fall apart. 
right? They don't just, they're not perfect. The graffiti gets old, the weather does what it does. So you have to allow some of that to, to fall off. And then you, 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 but it's a dance with it, right? Like it's push and pull kind of deal. Um, you have to, and, and with this work, I also raise and lower it a lot too. So a lot of it, I'll work flat. So the color and things like that won't run. And then if I want certain colors to run, I can raise it lower it based on how my studio was set up. Um, when, and then these pieces come in and out. So there's this constant, again, duality of, you know, bringing a piece inside the house, working on it there, taking it back outside, letting nature do what it's gonna do. And there's no rhythm. There's no like, pre, like, all right, at this time I'm gonna take this out and at this time I'm gonna take that. No, you kind of just gotta let the piece grow and, and fold, unfold on its own. Again, bird dog trainers in here, y'all will understand that. Um, you just gotta let the dog develop and grow the way it's gonna do um, with as little fingerprinting as you can. Obviously, it's my work, so duh, there's fingerprints on it, but there's the acceptance of the, this is the way things are going to happen within the work. Again, with dogs, these are the things, these are the ways that things are gonna happen within um, the development of, of whatever it is that you're doing. Um, yeah, man, there's that, there's, and, and the last piece of this entire thing is, um, and if you're feeling it, thank y'all so much for joining and with love, likes, thumbs ups, and so on and so forth. Um, but the last piece of it is the meditative aspect of what this work is bringing. So when you encounter the work, it should not be jarring. Um, I want people to come to the work. Thank you all for that. I want people to come to the work with a certain type of reverence for time. Time is the one thing that none of us will beat. Um, and I want people to understand our relationship as humans to time because it's very, it's very, very, very finite. Um, I want us to recognize that, you know, we because we don't have a lot of time here and that time, again, is very unpredictable, just like nature. Um, because that is the case, I want to make sure that you're inspired to go and be a part of nature after the fact and actually engage with it and celebrate it after the fact. Um, and that all kind of comes back to what it is that I'm doing with the entire brand, the Sporting Life Notebook. Um, it just became bigger for me. It became bigger because I recognize again, like so many years ago, when I got my Breaking Barriers Award, like there's a lot of there's a there's a an audience, right? And there's an audience of people looking for things that'll raise their vibration, bring good vibes to them, um, you know. And I'm an artist through and through. I've always been, um, and I'm glad to be able to merge my wing shooting and guiding an outdoor career with visual language. I'm I'm excited to be able to bring my wife into that and, and her strengths um, to the conversation as well as she speaks so much better than I do. Um, but, you know, I'm also glad to just bring people joy, man. Dave is on here. Y'all saw a video. Um, Dave from Fit Point Bird Dogs, Fit Point Kennels. You know, I was blessed to get capital from him and in exchange, like, giving him a painting um, of a dog that really moved me to liking short hairs honestly um, and I think that's important that we kind of communicate and share that um, with each other there's a lot of questions I also have about the outdoor industry man um, a lot of people got outside from COVID and great right like that was four years or two or three or four years of people being out for a solution, right? To boredom, to reconnection, to all of those things. But now that we're kind of getting out of that, what's next? What's keeping people outside? What's keeping people, keeping bird dogs that these people done got, um, you know, here and in, in, in what's keeping people tethered? Um, 
I don't know what that answer it can do to contribute to that is make art, right? And get art in people's hands, get people in arts experience. Some of y'all on this call, they, uh, Dave, Shane, a few other folks, y'all came to my show last year and I really hope um, that y'all were, I know you are, but I hope other people are as moved um, from that show as you guys um, told me you were and so on and so forth. So I think there's a large responsibility here in um, when people are connected to a larger cause. That's why I was that that she's we've been doing the research for and launching this season as well. Um, there has to be something to tether you to conservation. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything. Um, what are you doing to give back? What are you doing to bring people into it and into the fold? Um, this is just another extension of doing that. Um, and again, showing who we are as people in this particular time. What's up? What's up? What's up, Richard? Um, Richard, we were just talking about what our responsibility is uh, as outdoors people, but then also as an artist, where I think mine is in addition to breaking down um, that entire piece. Um, for those of y'all that did join, this entire thing will also be on a podcast. Like I said earlier, I'll probably be taking a like a week break and just get caught back up with show notes, episode descriptions, uh, content that I need to edit. <laughs> Richard, thank you, buddy. Uh, stuff that needs to be on the, the actual podcast format. Um, I, Richard, you were, you were too kind, my man. Richard Fryer, y'all go check out his um, interview YouTube channel. Uh oh, I need to charge my battery. Hang on. Let's see. Gotta plug it in. Um, for those of y'all that are joining, P. Jorn, what's up, buddy? Those of y'all that are joining, um, like I said, I was in the process of talking about this work behind me. I want to know if you guys have any artworks um, that y'all have seen or any artists that y'all have seen. Um, let me know if they've moved you. And any time that I'm in the GSP game, I'm even better. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. Um, and Dave is on here. Dave, you got on here at the right time. Um, Tanaya, thank you so much. Dave got on here. And Dave is the gentleman that gave me the short hair. And I went through that earlier, too. <clears throat> um, there will be a painting with a short hair like this um, in the back. <laughs> um, I'm going to do one with a brace of pointers and uh, one pointer, one setter. Um, that'll be that large too. I'm trying to get it done um, before the show. And for my short hair people, I'm probably going to do either one big one probably be half that size um i'll probably be half that size or i'll do a series of smaller works um let me ask y'all this though would y'all be interested in seeing the gold leaf in a smaller format as a work on paper um mixed into the watercolor india ink stuff would that be something that y'all would like to see? Because if so, I've got this idea to actually make the piece, but I want to talk about the development of that piece too. So if it's something interesting, let me know. Um, y'all short hair people are kind of, um, kind of, kind of a cult, man. <laughs> y'all are the short hair cult. Um, and obviously I didn't join in. So what's the price of it? Is the price of admission to the short hair cult? Um, a D. Lamar watercolor painting celebrating that short hair with gold leaf. Um, uh, let me ask y'all this. Is the connection still good? If you, if, if, if you can, I'm going to keep going. But let me know if the connection is still good. Um, the next thing 
the next thing that I really want to talk about is how the guitar piece comes into it, right? So, because that is so left field and Darrell decided to for some years now, but put it down, started family, and now I'm picking it back up. So for me, I think there's a crossover between not just playing like the campfire piece of it, but I'm actually really interested in the historical piece of guitars. Around there, there's some kind of parallel that I'm looking for between the history of guitar making and that development um, and the use of making them better and all of that stuff with the development of bird dogs and the, the development of firearms, um, fine shotguns. There is a, there's a, like a timeline and all of them seem to follow the same timeline. Um, Martin Guitars in 1833 and then, you know, some of the earliest pointers and set of time when I look at Ikaro, my dog, there's there's a lot of similarity between the timeline of that dog's lineage and like the development of guitars here um, and over in Germany. What I also think is really cool about the crossover between guitar history and bird dog history and things like that. Tyler, what's up, buddy? Um, what I think is cool is everything seemed to come here to America, right? And then for the short haired people, right? There's the German in, in influence of guitars, you know, and the founder of that. Um, but then also European dogs coming over here from Germany a little bit later, but then also from uh, really from Spain, I'm sorry, from Italy to Spain, uh, no, US. Um, there's a lot, and then of course, British guns coming over here to the US and the, and the, and the influence of that. All of those things I like the correlation to. Um, not only are they the integration of art forms here in America. Um, so there's, there's, there's that historical piece that I'm tying into as well, all to again, broaden the outdoor and the wing shooting experience. When people come hunt with me, you're not just paying to go see really cool places. And yeah, when people go on a guided hunt with you, they are paying for you and who you are as an artist, who you are as a guide or who you are as a whatever, whatever it is you do. Um, I think there's a way to deliver that and elevate the experience. It's not always about the high end lodge and then there's a market for it. Sure. But it's more about being able to deliver with deliver a highly curated experience one-on-one -on -one with it is about connecting and people coming out with you but like why hunt right like why hunt if there's no more to the story I, I just if someone goes out and shoots up a bunch of birds or doesn't shoot a bunch of birds at all what did they take away from the experience it's not horses and dogs and wagon most of the time when I take people out on hunt, they are, they're, they're telling, and I get interviews right at the end of my videos and things like that. So you guys see how people really feel, but people are telling the entire story. We're making memories. I give people paintings at the end of my hunts, these watercolor paintings and things like that, because that's something that I want them to associate with forever. Right. I want them to be able to not only tell that story, but to be able to see that story from the guide's perspective. And what's the most literal way for me to do it is make a painting about it as a thank you to the end of my hunts. Um, there just has to be more. And then again, I look at what is 2025 going to look like with the next year to this generation. We don't have the, 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 the kids and stuff that are following up behind us don't look like what hunters and, and anglers and wing shooters look like when I was even trying to come in. Um, I think we are raising and bringing and introducing a uniquely creative generation that is very heavily tethered to look at the track record of the arts over the last few years. Interest in it has, has also grown. And I also just think people are over the mess. People want things that make them feel good. And that is a good thing. Um, and not just is not just going out and shooting a bunch of birds. And I, I don't even like quantifying that. The hunting experience, people, 
people again tell stories the stories of of the people that you were with and i think again post covid and stuff engagement is going to be a huge thing so with that being said i can ramble on for today y'all have any questions and things like that i would absolutely love if y'all sent me dm whatever like that i'll absolutely answer any questions about the work um but yeah and this is also an extension of the american soil american soul series that i'm putting together and i figured i'd start doing that since two of these weekend interview uh podcasts ago i figured as uh, this being a part of the artist in residence piece collecting these and then y'all should be able to with that being said thank y'all for tuning in man and um i'm gonna catch y'all next time